How come when people bind the devil, he never stays bound? He seems to keep getting loose as often as people even bind him. You don't have to be in Pentecostal charismatic circles to hear people saying, I bind you, demon. I bind you, Satan. Get behind me. Uh, I rebuke you, things like that. You don't have to be in those circles to know or to hear people saying it. You hear it oftentimes. You hear it on YouTube, Google, wherever. Go to any particular ch certain churches, you're also going to hear the same thing. The question is, is that a possibility? Can people, do people have the ability to rebuke, to bind, or even uh, to step on his head? Well, if that's the case, how come it is that every Sunday somebody is binding the devil, but he never seems to be bound. Is it that someone is coming to unbind him? Well, no. The problem is that there's a misunderstanding of what it means to be loosed and to be bound and what it means to rebuke. And then also, do we even have the power to do so? And so before I go into it, I want to at least deal with what does it actually mean to rebuke? We'll get to being bound in a second, but I want to deal with being rebuked. And there's one time in scripture where we see the devil being rebuked. In Jude 9, it says, but Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Well, I want you to notice a couple of things. One, it says that this is Michael, the archangel. He himself did not want to bring a railing accusation against him. Think about it. We're talking about Satan. There's probably not an accusation that you could bring at Satan that isn't untrue and not deserved. But he himself did not want to bring a railing accusation against him, or reviling accusation, as some translations may put it. Uh, did not want to do that. And we're talking about him, Michael, the archangel, far above us in terms of his power and understanding. But what does he say? He says, the Lord rebuke you. And by the way, what does it mean to rebuke? It means to chide, to kind of put in your place, to, and in some cases, speak sternly, to warn, and so forth. Well, think about it if we do it. Notice it's not us rebuking him in the scriptures. It is not even an archangel. It is the Lord. When we rebuke someone, it's putting someone in their place, letting them know they're wrong. In other words, shaming them, chiding them. How does it look? How would it come across as us chiding Satan? What do you think he does with that? Not much. It's not going to not going to result in anything. Now, when the Lord does it, that's something completely different because remember, he controls, he determines whether he, even Satan can even exist now. So it's quite, it's one thing if we say so, which Satan has no issue with. Satan doesn't, it, it, it's, it's almost like water on a duck's back. But when the Lord does so, it's quite the other thing. And so to rebuke him doesn't do anything. Shame on you, Satan, bad Satan, bad devil. That has no effect on him whatsoever. If it did, we would see decreased demonic activity. However, we don't do that. We see an increase. As a matter of fact, Peter says that be sober-minded. Why? Because Satan is going around like a lion seeking he, whom he may devour. And rebuking him is not stopping him. Now, one of the other places that we get this whole notion of binding him comes from Matthew chapter 16. This is when Jesus is speaking to the disciples. Let's go there. In Matthew 16, verse 13, Jesus is asking them, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they say, some of them say that you are John the Baptist. Others say that you are Elijah, but still others say that you are Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And he asks you, who do you say that I am? And so Peter stands up and the other apostles, the other disciples are in agreement that you are the Christ. Thou art the Christ. You are the Christ, the Messiah. And what is Jesus' response? He says that blessed are you, Simon Peter, as he answered, he says, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who was in heaven. Notice he says, my Father who was in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't get this from reading anything or someone told you this, but this was revealed to you by the Spirit, by God Almighty. And so he says, I also say to you that you are Peter and upon this rock. Now, this is not referring to Peter that he's building this statement on. No, he said upon this rock, the this, the rock that he's speaking of, is the, this revelation that you receive from heaven, which is this. He says, upon this, I will build my church. That is that he is Christ and the gates of hell will not overpower. In other words, there will not be anything that's going to ever come against him being the Christ. Though we see now people coming against that, but it's not going to happen, not to any effect. There are going to be some that might be convinced, but they're not part of the church anyway. 
Going back to it, he says, I will give you the keys of heaven. Here it is. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then Jesus warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, there's much that can be said about this passage, even going further, but I want to deal with that passage, what he says in verse 19. Some of your versions might read a little bit differently. Let's go back to verse 19. He says, and whatever you bind on earth, look what it says, shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Some versions will say, whatever you bind will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. This is a better translation of it because if we go back and look into it, we'll see that the Greek of this verse is uh, have been bound is in the perfect tense. When he says whatever you bind on earth, it says shall have been bound. The Greek word is that a man on which is the perfect tense of being bound. The same holds true for uh, being loose is Leluminon, which is the perfect tense of being loose. What the perfect tense is, is we don't have anything like it in English. There's a way to kind of convey that if we use enough words. Uh, and in this case, in the NASB, it uses the words to kind of convey that. The perfect tense is a completed action from the past. And so what Jesus is not telling the disciples that they have been given the keys, meaning that they can do things and then call heaven to um, acquiesced with whatever their whatever their commands are. No, it says that whatever you bind in heaven, because it's a perfect tense, will have already been bound. Whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed on or in heaven. Meaning, all they're doing is being it's being revealed to them what heaven has already done. They're not calling heaven or causing heaven to move. Heaven has moved, and they're seeing it. Are you with me? So they're not giving given any sort of power, and so we also don't have the ability to bind uh, or to loose. The only thing that we can do if we have that sort of insight, particularly through the scriptures, that it has been done, which is the whole point of using the perfect tense. And so the disciples are only going to, and this is in keeping with this revelation that they also received earlier that Jesus is the Christ, that the same revelation, how they knew that, is also for them how they will know what to bind and what to loose because it's already been done. Now, that might lead to another story, another issue. Do we have that same power? Well, the Bible doesn't say so. The Bible doesn't speak about us having that same ability as well. Now, there is an understanding of loosing and binding as it relates to church discipline and so forth. And this is likely also what, what he may be uh, referring to as well. And so in that regards, if we are exercising church discipline upon other church members, that's fine. But in terms of applying this towards Satan, that's, that cannot be applied. Why? Because it says whatever you bind will have been bound, whatever you loose will have been loose. Well, if you try to bind Satan, has he been bound? In other words, has heaven bound Satan? Well, the answer is an obvious and emphatic no. He has not been bound. Now, he will be bound in the future. So let's go to Revelation 20 and see where the Bible speaks of Satan being bound. In chapter 20, verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, holding the keys of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. And he threw him in the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations any longer until the 1,000 years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short time. So in this instance, he's bound and we see the implications of him being bound. This is why this makes absolutely no sense. We should just disregard this and teach people not to say these statements such as Satan, I bind you or demon, I bind this demon or rebuke you. No, we see what happens when he's bound. Remember, Peter, as a matter of fact, Jesus even states what the activity of Satan is going to be. Jesus says that Satan desires to sift you like wheat, but I pray for you. Peter says that he's walking around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. And so his activity has not ceased. But as we look at Revelation, it says that he will be bound and that he will not be able to deceive the nations any longer during this thousand year period. At that point in time, he'll be bound, but then he'll also be unbound. He'll be released for a short time. And at that point in time, then God will make short work of him and deliver him as well as hell into the lake of fire. That hasn't happened yet. And so we need to get in the habit 
of reading the scriptures and understanding what it says that we can't bind him. But the truth of the matter is we don't need to bind him. In James 4, 7, he says, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and then he will flee. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so we don't have to even worry about rebuking or binding him. He doesn't have to be um, something that really even matters or comes up in our lives. What does he say? What's the remedy for whatever's happening in the world, whatever's happening, particularly with Satan, as he may come to you? And guess what? It's true that he might have designs or plans towards you or any other believer. That's fine. That matter for us because what's the remedy? Well, the same remedy now is what it's always been and what it will be in the future. That is draw closer to him. Then he says, resist the devil and he will flee. This part is clear. It says that he will flee. There's not an if possibly. No, he will flee if you resist him. But that's also in you drawing close to him. So you don't have to bind him. All you have to do is go closer to him. And then if that happens, if there's ever a need for him to be rebuked, well, what does we can just take the the lesson learned from Joe, from Jude, and th and that in drawing closer to Him, let the Lord rebuke him. Should the Lord decide to do so, but we don't have to worry about Him. Let Him be an afterthought. Uh, he's no longer our Lord, no longer our Father. We have a we have a new Father, a Lord that is God, and so let's just get close to Him, and we don't have to worry about rebuking and binding. That never works. Amen.